Before we begin, I'd also like to thank um, the artists who have contributed their work that you see on the walls here. Um, the paintings um, are by Samira Shafe Nejad. Have I said it more or less correctly? Thank you. Is there a title to these paintings? They're called Identity. Unending. Unending. They're called Unending. Thank you. And Sarah Man O'Donnell, what's this called? Rinse, repeat. Rinse, repeat. Okay. And um, who else? Do, do, do people know who the, at uh, Grace, who are those artists up there? Uh, oh, Jean Paolo. Oh, great. Uh, is there a title to it? Um, Jean Paolo? Along with what's in front, they're all part of something called um, Callings, Chantings, Speakings. It's called, sorry? Callings, Chantings, Speakings. It's a series. And if you could just introduce yourself to the camera and to the World Wide Web so everybody knows your name and okay. who you are. My name is Gianpaolo Cortino, and um, I'm a PhD student here at Bayern. Good. Um, and the people that are speaking again, Gianpaolo, 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 People who are so eating at the back, bad people. Okay. Um, I think, thank you. <laughs> now you're a good person. Okay. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce you to the next set of um, speakers. It, we, this set will be kicked off with Andrea Jesperson, who is from China. No, from China. <laughs> <Sorry. London. laughs> yeah. um, and. Um, she will actually, as she says on the thing, she's a visual artist, but her work is uh, internationally uh, known uh, throughout Europe and North America. And um, I will let you speak. You can do the rest. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you first for the, you guys who went before me giving great talks. Um, as, as it says, I'm a visual artist. Um, my practice is multimedia art practice, exploring how conceptual considerations and the handmade can coexist to mutual benefit. Uh, Did you hear that, Brent? Yeah. Brent? Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I'm engaged at the moment in a practice-led PhD where one of the research objectives are to reevaluate conceptual art practices utilizing, utilizing handmade production from the 1960s and 1970s. So what is a photograph? I seek to answer this with a reference to art history, a trip to the dark room, both guided by my practice, starting by asking why photography belongs in my practice. I select the photographic medium when conceptual consideration validates its use, as opposed to a photographer who works solely with the photographic medium. My aim is not to make a perfect photograph, but rather to use the photographic medium to accommodate an idea and further processes. Which was also the case with early West Coast conceptual artists at Ruscha and John Baldessari. They too didn't have an intention to make a photogra photograph for its own sake, but rather chose the medium to accommodate their ideas, as for example in Ed Ruscha's artist book, 26 gasoline stations from 1962. When considering photography for a new project, it is the medium's methodology, <coughs> social history, and art history that are weighed. The photograph function as a foundation in my practice, supporting my conceptual research. Wait, can you just go back to that slide? Yeah. That's a very interesting graph. Well, it's early eight days, you know, I'm still developing, this is still morphing all the time and changing, but this is a snapshot actually half a year ago, so it's probably already evolved. But it's just the kind of way to kind of think about how my practice, mm -hmm. my thinking work. That's okay. a bit better. <laughs> um, let's see where we are. When considering photography for a new project, it is the medium's methodology. I've already said that to you. Let's go away. It is remarkable how photography played a vital role within academic art history. With the arrival of the slide, made it possible to compare all art literally next to each other, facilitating a leveling of scale, period, and style. Hmm. So 
sorry, I'm having a bit of a, here we go. The arrival of the computer has changed photography's position as the, represent, as the representative, representational tool. Today, photography is still part of the archival reign because of the arrival of the digital photograph. Digital photography's well-known general mutability has finally made all photography perceived as subjective. Fine art photography has made the most out of differentiating itself from documentary photography and other photographic professions by emphasizing that an artist makes a photograph. With the arrival of digital photography, we have all become aware that a photograph is made and hence it is a subjective fragment of a reflection of the world. In my current project, Silver Halo, connected with Medical Mission in Copenhagen, I've been working with black and white analog photography as a reference to a time where the photographic was a privileged realm of visual communication. I'm working large scale, human size, which today we are familiar with, if not desensitized to, with the digital Im image and the inkjet printer's quick, cheap, and easy multiplication. Though the thing is, there's nothing easy about hand printing large scale photographies. It's photographs. It is physical hard work that involves your whole body. You are in the dark room, the noise of the extractor fan, and the smell of the chemicals. First you switch on the red safe life, then you handle the heavy roll of 250 GSM thick paper, 110 centimeter high and 30 meter long. You cut off the two meters you need. Then the photographic paper is rolled back up and put safely back in the box to avoid the accidental contamination with light, potentially pouring a thousand pounds down the drain. <laughs> Carefully, without <coughs> making creases in the paper, you attach the two meter long piece to the wall. I should say here, you don't do this in a light, lit room like this, you do it in the red light. But the sudden, obviously, so this is just for you to easier see it, basically. So it's still red light. When the, photogra when the photographic paper is safely positioned in the right place, you expose the paper by pushing the timer on the larger. Slowly taking down the paper from the wall with, without denting it, you merge it into the water to let the paper drink, making it absorb the developer smoother when it next is emerged into the chemical. The whole process of developing the photographic print is done blind, since you continually roll the print while you take it from developer, stop, fix, water, rinse aid, and ending with water. It is 30 to 45 minutes back and forth where you never get a glance to see where that image has emerged. After the last wash, the photo is carefully spread on the wall and water is removed from the paper and finally it's a chance to evaluate the photo. After this, so then it's time to get the photo to dry, which is not as simple as it may sound. If the thick fiber-based paper is simply left to dry or contains too much water, it will curl up. So to get it to stay flat, water is removed and it is stretched with gum tape so that when the paper dries, the tape holds it in place and the print is tense to a perfect flat surface. After this battle with the material, the photograph becomes an object to me, the maker. The photographic novice viewing will not know of any battles fought, and neither would you if you hadn't just listened to this detailed and potentially boring explanation. So there is a discrepancy in the effort got into these photos and that which the viewer perceives has happened. In large detail painting, the viewer will assume it has taken forever to do, but a large-scale photograph, like for example in the work of artist Jeff Wall, we are less likely to contemplate this aspect of the work. So what is a photograph? <coughs> in my practice, a photo can be either digital or analog, and both are inherently mutable via photochemical photography or graphic image software. Both are deteriorate with reproduction. The digital <coughs> by a compression which is inherently part of our network society. 
There's been great shift in photography since the arrival of the digital. Philosopher Roland Barthes and writer William David Mitchell could represent the group that owes this change to the negation of the chemical, whereas terrorists Terrorist Peter Lunenfeld could signify another cluster which argues that the shift emerged from photography's alteration from a photo to the graphic. As an artist, I use any type of photograph when and if it can support the idea behind the artwork. And then a new unit of photographic choices emerges which becomes the beginning of a photograph. Like, for example, color, black and white, digital, analog, format, sensor quality, grain, pixelation, surface, paper, final size. The photo director for National Geographic, David Griffin, characterized another dominant faction who would argue that a photograph emulates the way our minds freezes a significant moment. I don't necessarily agree that a photograph is focused or connected with our memory. Instead, I subscribe to photography that has its roots in the 1960s or 70s, when together with the casual drawing, they became artworks in their own right, claiming the position within art. The mechanism to show conceptual artworks that are either too costly or physical impossible is via drawing or photography. Both mediums are carrier of the conceptual idea and pivotal to conceptual art. In my practice, I've started to sandwich photography and drawing together. Ordinary, a drawing and a photograph would refer to defacement. When I draw on a photograph, I'm very aware that I'm spoiling a perfectly decent photographic image. In some ways, I'm corrupting the photograph and with it also the conceptual. My intent is to flatten the hierarchy of knowledge. I draw simple drawings that anybody can do. The drawings are seeking to pleasingly interrupt in a hope that the viewer will contemplate it as much as the photograph behind it. It could be summed up as an enhancement. Instead, the motivation is to represent different value systems where none is superior. Within art history, artist Robert Rauschenberg's seminal piece, Erase de Kooning, is a pre-conceptual art piece that was conceptually changing the established hierarchy within the 1950s contemporary art scene by replacing the expressionist painter de Kooning, who was king of that whole scene in New York, with himself. I'm not trying to replace anything. Instead, I'm trying to, as I said, flatten the hierarchy. I'm attracted to knowledge which hasn't been as ascertained through the classic channels of society. So I photograph objects and spaces that were built by and represent male power and knowledge in an attempt to add some of what was denied authority and witted value. It is not a coincidence that it is a female hand to make the photographs, drawings, or if represented in the films I make. I have a lack of contentment with the photography, hence a form for revision happens when drawing. Tension emerge when I start drawing on a finished analog photograph. It is taking a long time to make. I don't want to ruin it. The intention is to add to it instead of reduce it to nothing. As I draw, I become conscious of my own consciousness. The finished work does not necessarily make the viewers aware of their own consciousness, but they are confronted with a subjective effort, action, which does reflect on consciousness. So what is a photograph? Right at this moment, a photo photograph is, to me, alchemy, a non-objective illusion, a conceptual facilitator, and a historical index. Hmm. Any sorry. questions? Hana? Oh, no, sorry. Anybody have a question? Mattia. Uh, yes. Um, Just say your name again, please. Mattia. Um, <laughs> I, I am also an artist who I am using photography, and I find that you are uh, description of the process, particularly on the spot. Can you raise um, your voice a bit? <clears throat> I just said that I was an artist at the time with this photography, and I found this description particularly proper to, to the approach um, that can be brought to photography. But the reason why I wanted to, to make a comment is because I really wanted to link these to what Daniel said before the break. This is a use of photography that doesn't really care about the object. 
but cared about what can be done with it. Would and you say that's true? I thought you were to say it quite differently when I was kind of studying that. <laughs> so you may have to just repeat well, or you, say it in a different the, way. The, 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 <coughs> the apparent problem, I put apparent in quotation, Daniel uh, criticized in the words of seeing photography as a medium for documenting reality and nothing more before being uh, locked in a linear presentation, being conservative. Um, it's not the way you are using it. No. You are using the process. You are using the value attached to the process. You are using the expectations that we have. You are using all the in, um, set of vectors, and I'm sort of already giving you a word I'm going to say later, that intersect in the image of the photograph. And that's rhizomatic. Because that's not absolute. It's not a grid that is respected there. It comes together every time in different ways with more or less vectors. So and somehow liking what it said and defending that its position. Yeah, <laughs> because I think for me, I didn't kind of go into details what my concepts are behind the work I'm do doing for this show in February at this museum. But actually why I chose the old process is because it contains silver, and silver has been connected with healing, and it's part of the whole me medical canon. So there's a very specific reason why this material is chosen for this specific solar show at this medical museum, where a digital photo, it, while I was in the dark room, it took me two months to create a few images. It was a nightmare. And I obviously <laughs> thought, why am I doing this to myself? It's really physical, draining. And, also, just I didn't either talk about this is the dying art. Printing that big black and white photograph is actually really difficult. There's a few places in Europe where you can do it, but there still is the setup. So it's kind of a dying art <coughs> knowledge, and I was interested in that too, tying in with my whole flat and character and all this. So there was many reasons for choosing that, but one of the reasons was not that it's a digital. It wasn't to do analog because it has this uh, classical art history. A connection. That was never my intention. That was not a choice why I did it. And I'm doing digital films for the exhibition as well. So for me, all these reasons that each material and process represent is a vital part of the choice. So Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel, then why? Then she I really want to talk to, to, to this thing you just raised. When you say that making prints is difficult, but I think it is really important, it's absolutely key. And it's usually completely forgotten. People just think there is a kind of transition that is kind of embedded in the process. Well, no, we have to actually do very particular things in the dark and follow a very prescribed set of actions at very prescribed temperatures and consistencies in order to get something that resembles a photograph. So that makes me suggest that perhaps essentially photographs are invisible. And they're only made visible by certain cultural actions we perform. But in, if, if photographs have any kind of essence, their essence is absolutely radical invisibility and unknowability. And the fact that we made them something we can look at and discuss just says something about our own culture, that it values these sort of things, but not nothing to say about photography. So in other words, it's the Higgs-Boson particle. Is? It's Higgs-Boson particle. It's a uh, particle. Yeah, or Cora. Mm -hmm. well, uh, interesting question is something similar to myself. Okay, so just raise your voice. Just... <laughs> yeah. um, I'm putting my experience in the context. The length of time it takes to produce the work, is that indicative of the actual the process and the idea behind the concept as well? We were actually spending a long time contemplating, developing, reworking, rather than producing a crucial option, something that you could probably achieve much more quickly. I, I think what something is to come back to the whole, for 10 years I hadn't been printing that big black and white, and I, the last project where I used photography was color. So it, it had been a long time since I'd been in the dark room that intensely. And because in a color dark room, I should say, for the people who, are, who haven't been in one, there's no light at all. So there's a huge difference between being in a color black, dark room and in a black and white. Because in a black and white, you can actually see yourself. You're in this red glow, where in a color, you are totally relying on your senses because you can't see anything. So you're just kind of blind, basically. So what I hadn't foreseen with the the time spent in the dark room was how much that fed into the work. And I think that is a crucial thing. And it is part of my research as well, giving this kind of, I call it mindfulness, but it is, I, 
I have before said about that residency I did in Copenhagen that it, the best ideas I got in connection with my work was in the dark room. And it was crucial to write them down because they would often be those kind of good ideas where they're so brilliant and you think, this is so logic, I'll remember it when I get out of the dark room. And you, I never did. So it was crucial in the dark room to make these notes because it really, you had to grab them almost. They're like butterflies, kind of. So I think, the, I definitely think that the whole group of works, also the digital films I then did later with a harp, player in the, in the museum's auditorium. All these things would not have happened if I hadn't had those kind of... So the production process is a contemplative, or could, could be contemplative. Yeah, yeah. Sheena? Yeah. Just a little bit on... Just about, can you just also introduce yourself again? Oh, sorry, I'm Sheena Calvert. Um, th there's just a question that came into my mind as in reference to what you were showing, but also something Daniel was pointing to before. <laughs> And it's just going back to this idea of what is a photograph as a physical object. And, for example, having worked as a designer for many years, is a photograph still a photograph when it's actually reproduced using offset lithography? Is it still a photograph when you take the photograph and you silt screen it? Is it still a photograph when you kind of, you know, materialise it in different ways? You know, we, we haven't really kind of dealt with that. A photograph, does it change when it enters into these different spaces? You know, obviously, analog and digital is one split, but there are many others. So what's the difference between a photograph and an image? Mm. I suppose that's another conference in time. Yeah. <laughs> so I just made me oh, think about good. what you were saying. Yeah. For me, I think it is about the um, original. What, what you, I can't even remember who said it, about the context. That was you as well, wasn't it? It was talking Andrew, about the, was the intention, the intention of the... Mm. So I think that's where it starts for me. Yeah. So did it have its birth as a photograph? Then it doesn't matter to me that you make it into a screen print or mm. other kind of footage review or whatever. For me, it still is in the family of photographs because of that where its birth was. Where Does that started. require you to have made the photograph, though, or me, just take it from some? No, or any of us maybe taking a photograph from somewhere else. Does it? Does that no, change? No, I don't think that matters. Mm -hmm. I don't think it matters who is. Mm -hmm. it. Um, Sarah, and then Andrew, and then Dave. I have two questions. Uh, the first is that um, some of the images you showed uh, of museums um, or other beautiful spaces. Uh, reminded me a lot of the museum scenes from Chris Marker's La Jete. I don't know if you're, you're not, okay. Um, Can you, maybe other people don't know that either. Can you tell everybody else what that is? Uh, no, I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a film from 1962, I think, by uh, Chris Marker, which is, um, if you're interested in in image, you should go. We should probably all go to the theater and watch it right now. Um, anyway, there are some scenes um, where uh, there, there are visits to a museum, and there's still images. There are images that seem to be still uh, of, a muse of, of these museums. And so uh, the dinosaurs with the eggs. Um, anyway, I can skip over the Chris Marker part of the question. Um, but so it, it led me to think about um, uh, curatorship. Uh, the cure and the role of, the, of, of, of curation in your work, um, especially once you started showing the images, uh, which I assume you yourself had assembled these um, c compositions of objects that you were then photographing. You mean the one like <coughs> big scissors and oh, like yeah, an egg, yeah, yeah, yeah. just stuff, yes. right? So, so you're you're, you're on, on some level curating mm -hmm. these these compositions. <coughs> I wouldn't use the word for curating. Because, you wouldn't use the word curating. Because as an artist, there is always inherently a kind of struggle between the role of the creator in, this, in the art world and the role of the artist. And actually, my research looking into conceptual <coughs> art from the 1960s and 70s is specifically also looking into this whole role about, about the role of the artist as a writer, as, as kind of composing their own exhibition. So as an artist today, I would kind of... I wouldn't really use the word curating is quite loaded. That's what I. Would. So I would rather say I am um, creating. I'm kind of making this image, right? Which was kind of part of my talk that I would kind of state that any photograph, even the ones that try and kind of the decisive moment, the kind of split second photo, even that is created. He stood on a corner for hours waiting for that person just to come by at mm. that point. So just, and it's also about in a photograph, what do you leave out? What do you mm. leave in? What film are you using? Is it graining? Is it sharp? You know, is it a black and white? Is it a color? Yeah. So I would argue that there is always somebody <coughs> behind it that has made, and it's even Brendan, 
with his even Brendan yeah even Brendan <laughs> <laughs> decision no but we were talking about that earlier on the train up we were talking about this whole thing even when you try and make it really random you know, it, it often there is some decisions you make you know, what film are you putting in that camera yeah sure but yeah. I mean I, I, I wouldn't oppose curation to an attempt at randomness I guess I guess given what you just said I would just maybe make the observation that your composition is a, perhaps a radical intervention into curation, yes. especially given the fact that you had those images that you were showing us of what looked to me like uh, a, a, a museum of natural history. And so there's, there's, there's some serious curation going into that scene that you then, I mean, not that a park, you know, or, or, or a building, you know, isn't also um, designed composed, what have you, but within the space of a museum, or of what looks like uh, highly historical, beautiful buildings, there's, I mean, you're intervening into a, into a practice of, uh, of curation. And so I was, I was just curious, but without having seen the scenes from the film, perhaps it's just not coming across. So, do you have a second question? Yes. Now? Okay. And then, um, then we're going to move to the other questions. Okay, so my second question was about uh, the way that you characterized your drawings, which uh, they're beautiful, uh, the images are beautiful. And I, I found it to be really uh, interesting and possibly troubling. Uh, I don't remember exactly, so I'm, I'm going to paraphrase yeah, yeah, what yeah. I got and then you can correct me. Um, but it sounded like you were saying that they're drawings that anyone could do, which to me <laughs> translates as... Um, uh, like sort of crafty or like an every woman's doodle, kind of like a, you know anyone can doodle mm -hmm. while they're mm -hmm. on the telephone, you know, in the corners of their paper. So I was interested in um, the uh, the link of that to um, women's work, um, to caprice, uh, and to your intensive labor in the dark room. Um, that was something that maybe we could talk about later. Um, but I was. What was it? Oh, I, what, what I was really interested in was the fact that to me those those drawings, before you qualified them as sort of doodles, uh, they didn't seem to me to be at all doodles. They seemed to have this um, amazing uh, history of art behind them. Like I don't know if you know the the drawings uh, of Unico Zorn, but they're not unlike yours, your your images, your your drawings, and. Uh, I, I could have talked about, it's really interesting to hear your feedback, it's really, really useful, and thanks. Um, I could have talked a lot about the drawings, but obviously we're here to talk about yeah. photography, so I kind of yeah. negated that. But the drawings have roots in histology, so basically cells. Oh, but okay. I'm also yeah. really interested in the circle as a mm -hmm. symbolic and kind of reference point. So therefore, I, I, I do these imperfect so, circle, but I think for me there is this relationship about, there is a relationship to labor, and there's also a relationship to, to uh, women, you know, basically. And also coming back to the time spent in the dark room, there's also something about these drawings take in really long to make, and we're back to the whole point about why am I doing them? Mm. You know, why did I not just do a digital photograph? Why did I not just not do the drawings? Mm. The photograph would have been fine on its own. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of tension there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> I just think we're really into a big slippage here. Yeah. <clears throat> because, um, you know, there's different discourses going on here, and we're all slipping happily into the discourse of art, which can, of course, answer the question of what is a photograph, and the, really the answer of that is, is it's a photograph because an artist is using it as a photograph. But it seems to me that it doesn't deal with, if you want to talk about a photograph, the other discourse, which is the discourse of, of reproduction. So there is a question about whether or not you know, your um, working practice of a photograph applies to everybody's photographs, or all the photographs that circulate in reproduction. I think, to answer your question, no. You know, yeah, no, of course not. So <laughs> so I but I would also kind of turn it on its head and say, would, would there be anything that you could really neatly hold it all in? I would say there probably isn't. But also, I'm here as an artist. This is my profession. And I'm here with a room of clever people that are philosophers. So I have to come well, as I, you. <laughs> I have to come here More presenting coming. my field and my profession as best as I can, and this is what I'm doing. So I'm bringing my thoughts on this subject in my language, my kind of way of working. And then it's for everybody else to kind of think about that and, and put it to a side. It has no effect on our thinking about photography. I think, oh, okay, that's interesting. And then 
take it forward in some kind of way. I don't think it's a problem that there is all these strands. I think surely that's the, the interesting. And I think also somebody said <coughs> earlier about, I think it was you talking about photography's uh, uh, surviving, or you said it in a different way, but I thought it persisted. Yeah. And I think that is the key. You know, just because we got the computer, it didn't mean that, uh, or, or how was it, there was this whole notion that when we got the telephone, we, we thought we wouldn't write letters anymore. And when we, you know, every time a new medium has arrived, we think the old will be disappear. I think it's not the case. I think it all has a role to play and it all intertwines. It all has things to bring. I like yeah, the fact I think that there's been the sure. idea that many photographers, that's not new, there, have, there are many photographers, but if you ask the question and you bring a bunch of people together in a room to say, what is a photograph, it seems to me that you are trying to cross-reference these, yes. of these many photographers, yes. you know, what is the thing that they all have in common or don't they have in common, if we, if we all go away and say at the end of the day, it's fine, there are many photographers and they're all different, and actually this word that holds them together is the problem because actually they're all dedicated in different practices, then fine, that's an answer. Um, but we're slipping, that's all I'm saying. We're slipping between the idea of the photograph is one thing or the photograph is many things with but many discourses. I, this, I don't think the slipping is a problem. I mean, you're saying, saying it as though it's a problem, but I, I think that that's actually. I'm saying there's something helpful. really important here about art practice yes. as well, which is that we're <coughs> asking, uh, we're asking actually a philosophical question in a way yes. about what is a photograph. Now art practice I think is about is about taking some of that understanding and making something which comments on it. Yes. It's an intentionality in the work and I think that that's what your art practice does. Yeah. You know, you the viewer will take something about what photography is from your work because you have thought about that. Mm. So I hope that kind of makes sense, but I, I, I think that there's a, so there's something really important here, not just about philosophizing about something, but what's the point? What's the point of philosophizing about it if we don't have some use for that philosophy? And I think that just to underscore what Sarah's saying there, um, at least at CIFAR, what we're trying to do, and, and it's happening around the world as well, is to not divide uh, philosophy, let's say, on this hand, and art or whatever on another, and science somewhere science. else, but to inhabit them and to, to wear them like clothes um, or whatever you want to say. That's why I, I kind of like the, the comment that it was alchemy, which is also the basis of philosophy, mm -hmm. although uh, many philosophers of today would Science. deny this. Okay, um, David, you want to? Dave, you want no, to? I just wanted to ask where did you subsume? Uh, sorry, my name is Dave Lewis, I'm from a London South Bank teacher. Um, I just wanted to find out whether technology, whether you subsume technology in any of those things, what photograph is, because um, just as a general point, to me. I, I think when I say alchemy, I do say it with a slight kind of, um, I, I don't just talk black and white photography. I talk about when I look at a photograph, a photographic work that I really like. Give Some of that, that can give me. So that's when I talk about alchemy, I, I talk it in a kind of embracing way in that sure. kind of whole. So given where printing is in terms of the history of photography, so if we imagine a sort of graph, so on a horizontal axis we've got years, and a vertical axis we've got from um, the Nietzsche brothers, and we've gone through to Ansel Adams printing Fuji's digital camera. What it seems to me is that as if we draw a line going 45 degrees up, we get from photograph, can't do this, it can't do that, and as we go on in time, and our technology gets better, then the photograph begins to be able to do things which is related to some of the ideas which yeah. we have now. So, I mean, how do you place your sort of, where do you sort of place your practice within that sort of virtual graph, as it were? Because you're printing, but well, I don't know how much you're referencing digital photography or the technology of 1860s. So I'm trying to. Um... I use uh, digital photographs and I do digital videos, so um, I haven't really worked with streaming in that sense, kind of. But I, I will come back to how I introduce myself. I, you know, I do. It, it depends what support the artwork. It depends what I want to do with this piece of art, this exhibition, and that will be where I make those choices. So it would be about the, what that project is about. 
So I, I was very aware coming here today that I was coming with a very old process analog photograph and I was also aware that I spent a lot, long time showing red images in the dark room, but it was kind of deliberate. It was a kind of way of saying, okay, this is part of photography too. And I would, and I also am interested in conceptual art, and in conceptual art, a black and white photographs like the ones I've shown you would not be deemed as conceptual art. It would be about aesthetics. So therefore, because I'm researching conceptual art, I'm interested in that friction. I'm interested mm. in about aesthetic works that also are conceptual. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I would be just as happy to work with a digital image if I'm talking about uh, other things where I feel that the digital image, either on a screen or projected or whatever, if that was going to work, then that would be fine with me. Brenda, you can have the last word and then we'll have one um, Just interesting, your graph, the 45 degree, I mean, I was just uh, listening on Radio 4 that the, uh, the last manual typewriter has just come off the, the production line. There's something about the death of, of technology. You know, I, you know, my partner's also a photographer, and I know there's increasingly, increasing difficulty in finding certain photographic paper or Polaroid, and, you know, so there's... You know, the graph isn't like, with time, there's increasing possibilities. I think we're now... Obviously, it, it's, it's creeping up. We're kind of like, there are things now which, as practitioners, no longer able to do, I think. So I think, I think the idea of what is a phot photograph has to, it's not growing, I think, the definition. It's, it's almost having to sort of shift along with, with technological possibilities. That's really yeah. good point. Okay, let, let, <laughs> very last exactly question. what I wanted to say before. Because what you just said is that we cannot ask what is a photograph. We have to, what is a photograph is always and inevitably attached to the, all the set of devices and processes. It always, the slippage to me is not between a presentation of documentary photography and artistic one, but between talking about it and using it. Mm. We cannot talk about it as if it existed as an idea. Well, that's one, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, no worries. Um, thank you very much. I think we're gonna move on to Maggie and then to, da uh, and then to Darren, if that's okay. You're gonna, okay, so let's shift it around then, if that's okay. Darren, why don't you come up first then? Yeah, this is, um, this is Darren Newberry. He's professor of photography at uh, BIAD at uh, uh, BCU. And um, he will... Do you want to sit here? Let me show you. Sit here, sure. Do you need this? Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Johnny, for inviting me. <clears throat> I should say, I suppose, um, I don't talk as either an artist or a philosopher. Um, I come to this probably as a, a, a sort of historian of photography, although I'm, uh, I was trained as a photographer and I'm old enough to sort of remember being trained in, in and to be quite nostalgic about kind of black and white printing in the dark room. Um, I haven't prepared a um, paper as such, I've got, I've got sort of, um, a few sort of fragmentary thoughts about um, my approach to images and how, uh, and how I think about photographs and, some, and a few images to, uh, to hang those thoughts on. As I say, I, I come from a sort of practice background but, but spend my time mostly as a, as a historian of photographer now. So I am very much interested in representation. Um, but I'm also interested in um, the, the kind of circulation of images, both historically, but um, of course in my own work, the kind of, I, I have to say I haven't given a great deal of thought to digital and, and the impact of digital, but, but clearly in the, in the way that I'm working now, um, kind of digital images are um, very important to the way it's possible to circulate the kinds of images that I'm interested in. Um, I spent the last seven or eight years researching the history of South African photography, um, and it kind of seems important here in, in that actually the, the kind of historical and political realities that are depicted in the images are really quite crucial. Um, that's not to say that there's any unproblematic or straightforward relationship between the images and what's shown. Um, I get um, I tend to get rather irritated when people use the term straight documentary because I don't think any documentaries. Uh, straight in the, in the kind of sense that's implied by that term. Um, I think documentary is, is actually um, often more complex than, than people tend to use the term uh, as a sort of uh, 
sort of straw man, I think, in a way. Um, I'm interested, in, as I said, about in the, in the sort of mobility of images, in the circulation of images. Um, I'm interested in the relation of, of photography to memory and to history and to, to presentations of, uh, of, of history. Um, in terms of thinking about what a photograph is, um, there's a phrase that Susan Sontag use, uses, um, which is, she talks about photograph as an invitation to pay attention. And, and for me, that's really quite a useful uh, way of thinking about how I approach the photograph. And, and I'd like to think the kind of research approach I've developed is a way of taking that invitation seriously. That it's, it's about um, sort of following that through uh, in, a, in a really kind of uh, in-depth way. So in many ways, um, photographs for me are a kind of starting point for inquiry uh, where a number of things uh, meet. I'll just kind of put some images up. Um, um, something that, that was mentioned a little bit in the last talk but hasn't come up so much is, is um, photographs are also um, Story, whilst they might uh, move about virtually now, historically they're, they're material things, and that's actually really quite important to me. Um, this, um, these images refer to a collection I've been working on uh, over the past three years, um, which uh, I, I have, um, for a researcher, very privileged access to, because I actually um, am looking after the collection. But, so, but to some extent, the collection is also a physical um, object that I, I have to I have to look after. I actually have to look after it. It's not kind of just there. Um, amongst this collection are uh, some uh, nitrate negatives, which uh, those you, some of you may know what nitrate negatives are, but they're sort of uh, they need handling very particular care because they're combustible and they um, potentially could um, you know, uh, if, if they if they catch light they will burn and you might be able to put them out. And there's, so all sorts of kind of um, sort of health and safety and kind of um, uh, questions around that. So, so images, you know, thinking about that materiality of the image, I think is, 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 is for me, it's a kind of important aspect. Um, it's, it's become more important aspect because prior to that, I'd been sort of some working on photography on collections that other people looked after, and due to circumstances, I've ended up kind of looking after it and having to think about the kind of the home for this collection long term and the whole host of issues around photography that that, that kind of brings in. Um, so, as I said, I think for, for me the photograph is um, uh, sort of often a starting point for inquiry. I'm interested in, um, in a sense, in the research that I've been doing, uh, particularly this. This is a, this is Brian Heseltine. This is a uh, self-portrait from um, the early 1950s. This photographer was working in in and around Cape Town um, for for two or three years, um, photographing in townships, and this is one of the township photographs. Um, and clearly, he was. Thinking, you know, he wasn't thinking. I'm just documenting. He was thinking reflexively about photography and what it was that he was doing too. And I think it's a, it was a particularly interesting collection for all sorts of reasons. I don't have, uh, don't really have time to go into now. Um, but I'm also, I mean, to sort of just borrow some phrases from others without kind of giving uh, due credit. But I'm interested in um, what else has to be true for the photograph to be possible. So thinking about you know, using the photograph as a starting point, thinking actually what, what, what kind of historical, political, and um, social kind of uh, realities kind of underpin um, what photograph is. Um, I'm also interested in kind of reconstructing um, stories. In, for example, about any, when you're thinking about any image, you think about the story of the photographer, and I've had, you know, been doing a lot of um, biographical research on this particular photographer, thinking about the photograph, I'm interested particularly in the mobility of these images, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But also, in a sense, for me, it's not possible to really think uh, how I want to or think critically about the images without thinking about the, um, the, the kind of historical and, and social realities that you know, make these images possible to make. Not that the images necessarily show them in any straightforward way. Um, so I'm interested in that. I mean, I, for example, I mean, I've spent um, uh, much time um, in kind of uh, archives, looking at paper documentation, no images, for example, you know, reading the minutes of the Cape Western uh, Regional Committee of the South African Institute of Race Relations to find out about the images. You know, so kind of reading through these dusty papers to, to try and kind of understand something about how, these, you know, how and why these images came to be made, why they look the way they do. Um, I'm also interested in um, 
So it, there's both a kind of historical dimension, but I'm also interested in then about interested in what it means to reinsert these images into the present. Um, so mm -hmm. what does it mean to take these images, which pretty much hadn't been seen for about 50 years, and redisplay them? Firstly, for, for British audiences, um, some tricky issues there, but not, not quite as tricky as redisplaying them for South African audiences, which raises mm. um, all sorts of other kind of questions that I'm um, beginning to grapple with. I've shown them to some extent, um, or very briefly, to some South African audiences, um, but I'm interested in, in that you know that kind of re redisplay. Part of which, of course, is made possible by the digital, um, because. You know, it's able, you know, I'm able to scan them very easily, I'm able to transport them very easily, and so on. Um, so anyway, that's, this is a collection I've been working on. Just, um, just a few thoughts on kind of the, I mean, one of the interesting things about this collection is, is how the images have traveled. Um, and thinking, and also thinking, comments were made earlier about authorship. Um, this, I think clearly there is some kinds of authorship going on, but also, this photographer, his work was picked up and used firstly in South Africa by the Institute for Race Relations, who actually funded some of the work, um, presented in a particular way. The bottom image is, is from an exhibition um, in Cape Town in 1952, which is ostensibly about housing. I think the images, in a sense, that are part of my argument about the work is it goes beyond um, any kind of um, focus on housing. Um, then um, through partly through chance, partly through the photographer arriving in the UK in, in the early 50s, he left South Africa pretty much after making the work. Um, they were picked up by the emerging anti-apartheid movement, so an ideologically different context, um, a geographically different context, and the images are then represented, and, um, and he sort of allows the work to be used in that way. You know, in a sense, he, he didn't seek out, they're not exhibition opportunities he sought out. I don't think he, um, I think whilst he would have been, had an influence in terms of how they were selected, it wasn't entirely down to him, he didn't produce the text. Um, so there's a kind of, you know, the, the photograph, the photographic exhibition is not a single authored thing. It's a, uh, quite like Andrew's notion of a sort of collective act, because I mm. think there are many parties to the collective act of, of Sort of displaying these images in the first case, the first place, and then um, redisplaying them on subsequent occasions. Um, the image, the colour conflict in Africa, which I think is wonderful, it's actually the A5 flyer, um, was from when the images were shown in, in uh, the, I think the, the town hall, the borough hall in uh, Hales Owen in the West Midlands, mm -hmm. which is about eight miles that way. Um, so, you know, it brings it very much into a kind of uh, mm -hmm. locality. And, and the, the images, here is from a small exhibition we did at Pitt Rivers, Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford uh, last year, which tries to tell something of the story of that mobility, because that was um, doing a small exhibition in an anthropology museum. I think it was very important for me that there was some sense of um, uh, giving to the audience a sense of the connectedness of, of these things. Um, sorry, just, just moving on. Um, thinking about redisplaying images, this um, Piece on the right, actually, I haven't got the video, it's a short video piece, it's on YouTube, um, if you want to go and find it. Um, something entirely <coughs> random, um, unpredicted. Um, following the exhibition, I think it was earlier this year, um, I had an email via the curator, the, the head of photographs at the Pitt Rivers Museum, saying a, a final year um, fine art student wished to um, use one of the images as part of a performance, and the performance is her um, singing to the image. Um, swing low, sweet chariot. Um, mm. So that kind of completely unexpected kind mm. of picking up and, and reusing the image um, in, in ways that I can possibly have anticipated is of interest to me, and that's part of the reason for, for wanting to <coughs> display them in the UK, but also uh, in South Africa too. Um, so uh, one of the things I, I mean, just about to publish a book on this work, but um, one of the things I've been thinking about is, is how does this, how do you insert this work back into contemporary South African photographic culture? What does it mean to do so? And just thinking, um, just using this really as a way of sort of prompting um, some thought on, on the kind of, what I might argue is, is the sort of resonance between some of the interests that this photographer had, which in a sense have outlasted, I think, 
some of the ways that we, images were picked up and, and used. Um, and I think maybe, and that's a hypothesis, I guess, um, have something to say to the present. So this is the image on the left is from you know, 1951, 52. Uh, the image on the right is uh, sort of early 2000s, I think, by Zoletta Maketla. Um, again, sort of photographing the interior of, of township houses and, um, it, you know, there's a sort of visual similarity in those places. The question is, is it just that? Is it just coincidence or is there a, a, a kind of more um, uh, substantial kind of set of shared concerns there? Um, and again, similar kind of, um, similar kind of juxtaposition. This is uh, the image on the right is Zanane Maholi, a contemporary uh, South African photographer, so mm -hmm. sort of noting the kind of visual similarity and, and thinking about does that prompt uh, prompt other kind of thoughts? Um, okay, just one one more example. The reason I kind of brought this um, is is sort of partly related to one of the things we referred to in the in the invitation. Um, this is uh, one of Ian Berry's photographs um, of the Sharpeville massacre of 1960. Um, if you don't know what the Sharpeville massacre of 1960 was, essentially. Um, Black South Africans were protesting against the uh, fact that they had to carry passports everywhere, and um, the, the state basically turned on on this group of people and, and shot them. And Sixty-nine were killed, and it was a sort of watershed moment, really, in um, in South African history. Um, but it's also a significant moment photographically because it's the point at which, uh, it says, the, the visualization of the uh, of, of the. Um, South African struggle against the apartheid becomes an international thing, um, becomes photographically internationalized because these, uh, these images were uh, banned from being shown in South Africa but were actually sent around the world um, virtually straight away and, and in a sense set the pattern for the way in which South Africa was, was kind of visualized for the next 30 odd years. Um, but um, the reason, I, the reason I brought these is because in discussion with Ian Berry, the photographer, he talked about these as non-pictures, non not non-photographs, but non-pictures. Um, for him, they were, were kind of, um, and I kind of spent a bit of time thinking about this. I mean, I think what he meant was that they didn't, they didn't work sufficient, sufficiently well as news photographs, um, which was his kind of practice. Uh, but I also began to think that, that actually the non-pictureness of them Left them open in a way that was that was, you know, more akin to forcing you to think about the event. So I was kind of, um, you know, thinking about that that kind of aspect. The image on the right is is I suppose a kind of um, a South African township piece of photo realism. Um, it's uh, the, this image painted on the end of a, a gable end of a building. Um, on the site where this massacre took place, and it's it's still there. Although when I, I went to the the 50th anniversary, and it was, and I didn't see it, and I think it was because it was obscured by um, some of the, uh, the various kind of speakers and people. Um, so kind of interesting that it actually didn't. This image, this image, probably more than any of the others, with the guy on the bike, does is the one that turns up uh, mm -hmm. in a few places. But the, the visual image didn't actually play that much part in the commemoration. Interesting. Um, again, sort of interesting. I mean, you know, what is a photograph? Well, on one hand, a photograph is, is a performance, and I think we've seen a number of images that are kind of performances. And this is quite an intriguing performance, if you like. This is um, the image on the left is uh, from 1970, uh, protesting against the Sharpeville massacre. The image on the right, which um, is a sort of news documentary photograph, was actually taken six years later um, at another, of, another sort of major event in South Africa's history, um, uh, the, the Soweto uprising, where uh, Hector Peterson was, was shot and carried away. And it's probably the most iconic image mm. of the South African struggle. But it's interesting to see that the kind of same image was sort of prefigured in a, in a commemoration of the Sharpeville massacre of 1960. So it's kind of interesting relationship between the sort of, both the mobility of images, of, of, of photographs, but also of, of kinds of image as well, and kind of what that, you can speculate on what that draws on. Um, 
and okay, changing tack again, as I said, this is <laughs> not quite a coherent um, kind of presentation. Uh, this is something included in the, um, the exhibition we did here. And this, I mean, it does link in a way, and this is, these images are sort of partly of that performance. Um, these are images taken at um, the Van Riebeck Festival, which is essentially celebrating 300 years of, of white settlement in South Africa, and uh, which clearly is not something that um, the black population would have found very um, um, congenial, shall we say. Um, so, in, in redisplay, you know, so these are kind of difficult images, the images that one has, to, I, you know, I think one has to be careful displaying. Um, so, in well, you can't see it here in, in the exhibition we did in, in Oxford. These were both the smallest images and the images with the longest captions. So there's mm -hmm. a kind of attempt to mitigate the kind of performance of the image. Um, in fact, they're not quite images of the performance. They're really images of the construction of the performance. So there's another kind of layer there. But, um, mm -hmm. And I think this might be the last image. Um, yeah, it's the last image. Just another way to think about photographs. Um, photographs are things that people talk about. This image is um, Blumhoff Flats in District 6, an area that was subject to forced removal during the apartheid period. Um, immediately I showed this image uh, in, in a South African museum, talking to a group of people. Someone brings forth a story of, of, of a ferocious cat. This guy used to live in these flats, and he just immediately brings out the story of a ferocious cat called Zorro that used to kind of um, wander around these flats. So, you know, you'd never get that from looking at the image. It's about the kind of, in, you know, the, the image as a, as a kind of space for interaction. So mm. I think I'll... That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, anybody want to jump off? Yes. Uh, can you just say your name? Oh, I'm Barnaby. Oh, yeah. um, a little bit more Barnaby what? Sorry? And you? Oh, I'm... Um, a PhD student at uh, CIMAR. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested uh, by a couple of themes which seem to be um, jumping out here to me. Uh, Dan, your, your presentation seems to be about the, the your presentation seems to be about the problem of um, of imbuing an image with an with an iconic status in today's thing. You, 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 um, you're you're trying to kind of re-establish re an iconography that existed 40 years ago in today's world. And it's particular, yes, but the, your... Andrea. Andrea, sorry, I'm picking Sorry, I didn't know um, you your, your work uh, seems to be, at least the, the work that you showed us, seems to be about um, a kind of sacerdotal gesture in the preparation of the photograph. Um, and I wonder whether uh, the audience or either of you don't find that the, the that you're making this, these kind of gestures um, into a a world which is a, 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 an image economy which is now so expanding that it's utterly profane, and that you're trying to kind of um, you're, you, it's a sort of recherchist gesture um, which effectively becomes completely futile in the in this in this massive banal expanded economy. <coughs> Again, don't take anything insulting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, I, I, I wouldn't um, accept your characterisation of what I'm trying to do. Um, what I am, I mean, that is, there is a relationship to the iconography of, of that particular period. But what I'm trying to do, well, I'm both trying to understand that, but, but actually, rather more than that, try to go beyond, because I mean, the, the kind of um, the story of the iconography of the South African struggle is, you know, is kind of being played, played, played again. So it's kind of, in a sense, what I've, uh, in research I've tried to do is try to go beyond that and actually look at, um, to try and present a more complex picture of the development of photography, of the, the kind of the way in which those images have, uh, you know, the way in which, for example, photography has, uh, was a vehicle for the relationship between South Africa and how those images served within a kind of the emerging, you know, what was emerging in the 50s, anti international anti apartheid So it's more about trying to understand that than trying to represent it. Um, and I suppose, in terms of, yeah, I mean, you, you're right, these are kind of you know, the vast sea of images 
you know, um, stuff gets gets lost easily. But I'm, you know, I still think that you know the photograph or exhibitions of photographs can be moments, of, you know, moments where people pause and think. You know, and I suppose in relation to the contemporary, um, my my kind of what does this mean within South Africa is a hypothesis. You know, it's, well, it's not a hypothesis; it's a research question. Actually, what happens if you do? If you put them back in that space, what kind of response, or what kind of responses, is it possible you know, will one get? And there could be, you know, and I've had, uh, I mean, I showed some of these to undergraduate photography students, you know, college just south of Johannesburg, and they found most of them, or a lot, quite a lot of them, hysterical, and that was largely to do with um, what people were wearing, you know, the kind of you know, the, the parents or the grandparents. Dress them kind of, you know, can be quite humorous. And so that was what, that was their kind of relationship to the image. I'm interested in that. Sometimes you show it, you know, I mean, somebody said to me, well, isn't this just part of a sort of darkest Africa paradigm? Uh, to which I said, would say, not if you really look at the images. We can have that, you know, there are all sorts of questions around that. I don't think that's sustained by looking at the images. So I think it's more, it's more of a question I'm asking. And if, if the answer to that is, well, they just get lost. Kind of see images, well, I mean, that's the answer I'll get. Yeah, um, I th just also pulling in what Andrew had said about the collective act. Yeah. It seems to me that what your um, research and your presentation was drawing on is how this, how the photograph becomes massified, and the massification of it takes it away from kind of the privatization, the social agency of the artist, it's him or herself, and how it becomes something that's part of this other thing that's going on that we're just touching on very briefly at the moment. Um, there's a hand over here, was it? Yeah, can, Rob. Can I ask, do you, you meant, I think it was you mentioned something about the icon, uh, iconicity of the image. Mm. But do you, um, in, in compared, because there are some images from that period which are icons, and the ones that you showed I quite like because I've not seen them. Well, the, most ones, um, I showed you wouldn't have seen because right. they've really not been shown since the 1950s. Okay, so would you talk about them in terms of like in this city, sort of being from 21st century looking back in comparison with those uh, the images that you would have seen in Drum, for example? Mm. What's that space? How would you talk about that space in between the ones that we haven't seen in the 40s? Well, the, the, the these, pre these precede Drum, I mean, in the, in the uh, Drum is something, the, the photography that comes with drum is something that overtakes everything that's going on in South African photography up to that point. Mm -hmm. and, and with, I, I wouldn't say no connection, but, but almost no connection. You know, it kind of, you know, um, this, this guy would have had nothing to do with drum. Um, a lot of the, you know, the you know, photography was, the amateur photography scene in, in South Africa in, in the mid to late 40s was fairly conservative, um, you know, and, and drum is a, you know, a sort of burst of life into that, but um, and, and partly driven by outside, you know, it's partly stuff. I mean, which is why the exchange with Europe and with, with the UK is quite interesting, and also, I mean, drum obviously draws on American culture, so there's, you know, it's a complex. I mean, I'm interested in that complex <coughs> history and why, you know, why certain things, you know, why this, I mean, this. Practical level, this guy, nothing else comes from from him because he moves to England and has a career as a photographer in England, you know, um, but doesn't produce anything quite like this work. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's quite answering your question, but the, I think the relationship between these images and what comes after is it's a very complex one, and, and and I think it's in a way it's understandable that this work disappears because. Um, there is no, it's not connected. Once he arrives in England, and it, it, I mean, it get, gets picked up by the, the church. It's, it's, um, it was exhibited in England in the crypt of St. Martin's, um, St. Martin the Fields Church, you know, at the point at which the church is, is getting, you know, uh, involving itself in, in, in an emerging anti apartheid movement, partly to do with what's happening in South Africa. Um, but there's no other political connection of this work. And there's almost equivalent um, bodies of work that for other, for, for 
for different, you know, sometimes random reasons, end up in the collection of the International Defence and Aid Fund, which was what was linked to the African National Congress. And therefore, those works are seen as uh, founding works of struggle photography, even though visually they know they're probably less so than this kind of work. But it's it's a sort of historical anomaly, like you like depending on who, who's married to who and kind of um, and who who links up with who. So. Andrew, Rob, Daniel, and then we'll move on to Maggie. Yeah, right, thanks for the talk. Um, I mean, obviously, the whole analog archive um, raises kind of one set of questions about what is a photograph, mm -hmm. but of course, the digitization of the archive and then the networking of the archive raises a number of really kind of new and interesting mm -hmm. kind of questions. And I just wondered what you think the network can do specifically for your relationship to um, South African photography and those kinds of archival works? Um, well, it's a question I'm just beginning to think about, really. Um, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I, as I say, I have this analog archive. I intend, intend um, to see it safely housed somewhere, because I think that's important. Um, one of the struggles I've had, actually, is, I mean, what I could, I mean, I've got this, majority of it scanned, so I could put it all up on the website and see what happens. I mean, um, part, of my, part of what I wanted to do, or initially began thinking about doing, is having a, a kind of very uh, have, um, a sort of online digital archive housed somewhere. But actually most, most large institutions are not interested in digital if they haven't got the analogue. So, and the ambition is that the analogue goes back to South Africa. I think for um, I think the political reasons that's probably the right thing to do, although archives there are not so well resourced as archives elsewhere, so there's kind of some tricky things to think about there. Um, so I, yeah, I don't have a, a sort of full answer to your question, really, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's something, I mean, I'm, I both want the work to be secure for the long term, but also then want it to be accessible for, I mean, the, the, sort of, the historical collection, collections in South Africa are you know, regularly used by NGO type organisations, by local researchers, and I, I think that's the kind of uses, or at least potential uses, I'd like to see for some of this, some of this work. I mean, I'm, I'm told that the particular areas of Cape Town where this photograph has not been, you know, there, there isn't a vast amount of other material um, on them, so actually it kind of fills a gap in a way as well. Um, so I'm not answering your question, really. <laughs> it's because I haven't kind of got quite to that point. Um, Rob, and then Daniel. Um, well, a contentious question, but are you using these images of the 21st century now as memory of truth? Well, that's as memory of what? As memory of truth. A memory or truth. Oh, memory or truth. truth, right. I think the, the, the question I would ask is, is how do others relate to it, really? I mean, how do, you know, if someone wants to perceive it as truth. Um, the only thing to ask that is probably some of the people getting these images are still alive today, and their relationship with them should be seen on probably significantly different from yours, I was mm. or the photographers. Well, as I say, it's a, that would be a research question for me. I mean, I think I would be interested, actually, I mean, I, I showed you, um, presentation of this work at um, District 6 Museum in Cape Town um, as part of the Human Rights Day program. And we ended up, with, these were there, with ex-residents of, of an area which is not, not all of the images in that area, but some of them are. Um, and and the, the, most of the discussion was around where exactly this was, what street this was, um, <laughs> which is, um, you know, one level might be, you know, I sort of begin to get a little frustrated with these people. On the other hand, you know, place matters. That act, you know whether or not you've got that, you know, you've got the right referent for it is important. It's important to have you perceive them. I haven't come across anybody who said, "Oh, I know who that is," and partly because of the kinds of dispersal that apartheid affected, that's very much harder to, you know, or very, very much more. Well, it's more. It's less likely, I think, that that's, that would, would happen. There's no, you know, there's no easy community or community organisations that one could go back to with this work. 
and say, oh, it represents your community. It doesn't. Those communities were, you know, Windermere, which is the area where most of this uh, work was taken, was ta literally taken apart racially and dispersed, you know, because it was an area that was mixed. So those people, you know, some would have gone to this township, others to another township, uh, you know, on, on the basis of race. So that kind of sense of taking it back to a community is, is one that doesn't quite work. But I, I would, I'm, you know, I am interested in, I'm interested in how people relate to them now. And, you know, and I don't necessarily feel I need to know in advance what that might be. Daniel, um, last question. And then yeah, well, I think if, if, was, if these were pictures, let's say, of flowers, of What's horses, happened to those that's pictures, by the way? Question. But as it is, as it is uh, about the apartheid, don't you think that the only thing that is worth what remembering is about apartheid is exactly what you cannot record in the photograph. And in a sense, what these photographs do, they kind of, uh, it's a sort of souvenirization of apartheid. And you can imagine Sharpeville on a key holder, Sharpeville on a mug of coffee, you know? And, and these are exactly the things that you don't want to happen. I mean, it's not, an, it's not by accident when they say um, Paul Nansen's uh, Shoah film avoids any of these things. Precisely because these kind of representations harbors some um, seeds of the same trajectory that brings the, the fascism or, 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 the, or, or the Nazi rhetoric. So in a sense, I'm not interested in the way photography is, is involved in the production of apartheid. It's not a, something that can stand against and make a record, but it is the apartheid comes out of the photographic rhetoric. I mean, um, except I would say that um, I don't think the images are just, I mean, uh, if you looking at particularly the Hesseltine stuff, one of the things I want to say about it is it's not just about apartheid, actually. The images are, the images are about something else. Um, and they, they, they can lend themselves to being about apartheid, but they can lend themselves to other things. And the, the, sort of, the research question I'm working with is, is, you know, do they lend them to something themselves to something else in the present, you know, um, that is not just um, a, a, a sort of historical story that one um, mm. you know, either wants to forget or wants to remember, whichever. Um, mm. that, that there's actually something else going on, is, is what I would say about that specific work, although it's not necessarily true about some of the other stuff. Thank you. That's very interesting. Maggie. Um, I came across Maggie's work um, in a completely different context. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, in the context uh, where uh, Dan O'Hara, who is somewhere, well, there he is, way in the back, uh, and Luke Mason, they are part of uh, Virtual Futures, uh, and that's going to be happening in September here in uh, Bayad. But anyway, um, October, sorry. Uh, anyway, and there was a little taster session that went on, and um, I was invited to come to this, and I thought this was an outstanding artist uh, whose work, who is um, resident in South Africa, and, and we were just very lucky because she happens to be in London for the last next couple of weeks. So I invited Maggie, uh, who doesn't really go by Maggie, goes by or Orphan Drift, but and also goes by many names. Actually, I wasn't even sure if that's actually the name you wanted to be introduced by. Um, so I leave it to you now, because I thought that she would be very, uh, also just adding to the mix of all the very important people who have spoken today, including yourselves who haven't spoken, um, on the question of what is a photograph, given one's work. Wherever you actually, if you come, so people, wherever you think, do you need to use the? No. No. Okay. Whatever is convenient. Can you hear, Brett? Can. Okay. I know you have to come closer to them. You're going to have to, I know it's annoying, but you're going to have to shout. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the mic is there, and there's also mics there. Where? You could sit where Brendan is. Yeah, I was going to say, do you want to because you're closer to your own. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me now? That's great. Leave that alone. <laughs> 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 no, because hide behind you. Okay. Um, so these first images are from our first show 
cyber positive in 1994. Three rooms of hand-printed photographs, all of moments in science fiction films at that period. Orphan Drift is a collaborative artist created in London in 1994 by myself and three other women. As an artistic entity, Orphan Drift makes immersive and visually complex works which use, uses the sample and the remix extensively, treating information as flows of matter and the image as a unit of contagion. Mimetic slippage across multiple images, the somatic intensification of experience. I'm focusing on collage and animation here because I'm trying to address the question what is a photograph in our work. Our college and collage and animation inhabit the liminal in order to access a metaphysical dimension, the unknown, the hidden, unidentifiable substance and trickery, communication with the unseen. And this is from Robert Pelton's The Trickster in West Africa. Liminality is a positional as well as temporal phenomenon. It is symbolic of the liminal state itself and of its perma permanent accessibility. A matrixial border space, a catalyst for social and individual transformation. It can overlook the usual requirements of biology, economics, socius, even of metaphysical possibility, <clears throat> in order to posit radically altered limits. The invisible, fantastical and anarchic called upon here are what Deleuze and Guattari defined <coughs> Can I have a time bit of your water? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the invisible, fantastical and anarchic called upon here are what Deleuze and Guattari define as the essence of virtuality. These intensities carry the sorcerous forces that technology and science unleash as they delve further into the quantum, the chaotic, and the abstract. Much of our work, both then and now, is expressed as shifting layers of disturbing, schizophrenic, deconstructive, poetic, and fragmented frequencies that take effect through a fluid mesmerism. A friction between digital and analogue signal is visibly embedded in the work, describing the slippage between fiction, or the virtual, the abstract, and 3D reality. Our recent video work, A Wilderness of Elsewhere's Colony One, has been shown in Santiago and San Francisco, and at the Virtual Future Salon. I'm about to screen it, Dark abstract video spaces flow into bright photographic landscapes, populated and depopulated by collages or photographs of architecture and fashion. They are represented as elements suspended in a sonic event, a kind of non-sight. We are trying to conjure the unrepresentational, what might pulse just beyond the limits of current knowledge and consciousness. The photographic collage elements are a form of evidence and presence, yet fleeting and ghostly, existing only as interventions, moments on a surface. They transmit indistinct meanings and layers of possible interpretation. With this video and with my current collages, we are colonizing experimental realities weaving space and matter into fluid, temporary <coughs> configurations that are essentially science fictional. This making images operate in feedback loops or as software of the unconscious generates a liminal rather than representational presence that inhabits prediction and flux, resisting definition and containment. The liminal is a contemporary cultural necessity, <coughs> always slippery and ambiguous, dissolving boundaries and opening horizons. The connect it is the connection for me between the potentially and the actually human.
That is a beautiful piece. <coughs> Yeah, any questions? Dan, do you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, just about a year ago, for like, what, how many? Hundred years. Early 20 years, years. yeah, something like that. I'm going to ask you a mean question, Matthew. Um, You're going to ask them what type of question? Mean, mean, mean question. Oh, yeah, that's good, yeah. Um, Perfect. Non-representational art, specifically with reference to uh, the, the film, not to the not to the original Colour. installation uh, collages in the cabin. Um, you talked about um, showing us um, non-spaces, unrepresentable spaces. That seems to me to be something different from non-representational art. That's representing the unrepresentable. I didn't actually I say wrong? showing. I said we're trying to conjure. Conjure. Okay. Okay. That's a bit more lateral or something. All right. But anyway, but could on. you say something a little bit more about that? Just to be, just to be more precise about the difference between non-representational and representing or conjuring what is not representable. Is that the means of the question is or more? No, that's that the question. <laughs> um, I think the trying to conjure and the unrepresentationable is more like we're trying to directly approach the body in the viewer, a, a sort of somatic response and the emotion. We're not trying to go for your logic and that analytical... It, it's sensory in the widest possible way that there's something lurking in all this sort of fluid, excessive imagery that's not... Um, about the representation of all. Represent, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think that, I mean, that's exactly what I was wanting to, wanting to get out from you for the benefit of everyone here, because it goes right to the heart of the question that uh, Francois Lauer asks in the principal text, where we're all supposed to be addressing uh, here today, um, a very delighting question of what is it that an image can do? Yeah. And that's a fundamental what is a photograph for Laruel, and uh, I feel that you're, you're touching on something that has the potential to actually start answering that question. Can you what is it that can, an image can do? For those people that don't know who Laruel is, can you, can you just elaborate slightly on that article that you're referring to, because a number of people haven't read it, right, and it would okay. be helpful. Um, it's, it's, it's a book that Francois Laruel wrote, um, part of a series of um, responses of his to Deleuze's claim that what philosophy needs is a non-philosophy. And he began with a, a, a book about non-philosophy and then uh, this book that we're addressing today and where he makes this statement is uh, his volume on non-photography. Um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later. Anyway. Yeah. So, no, but in terms of then directing it back to um, Maggie's work, what you're asking her, are, are you asking her, is what is being seen, what, what she's showing, in, in total, an answer to the question, what is a photograph, are you saying that in, all, in each of her pieces, there lies different relationships that answer the question, or that deal with the question, maybe don't answer it, but, or, or problematize the question? So, in other words, some people might feel uncomfortable that what Maggie was showing was, in fact, a kind of combination between, um, you know, a, a moving visual landscape and things that sometimes made sense, didn't make any sense, or whatever, they, and they had two split screens and so on, and that would often not be seen as a photograph at all on any level, you know. So the fact that it's being presented in an in a environment that says, what is a photograph, seems to me your question is asking, you know, taken as a given, that work is 
directly speaking to the question, the answer to the question, what is a photograph? Something like that. Is that what you're asking? It's directly speaking to the question, what is a photograph, when that question is framed as, what can a photograph do? Um, in other words, it's a non-essentialist yes, um, non approach. Which is, I think what Daniel was also speaking about as well. Mm -hmm. Sarah? No, I, th I mean, I think that it's connected to what we've been saying about the notion of a core, about, about what can a photograph do. That if, if there's something in that process of photography which um, speaks to the body, And what you're doing, what you seem to be doing here, is, is speaking to the body, the liminal. The, the, I think it's more, it's a more abstract thing than related just to photography. Yeah, but you I know. Yeah, but I find, um, I realised with the the collages, for example, I actually, I'm when I'm making them, they are. A sort of form, and then I recognise it's right and um, it's real. I mean, they're all made up of photographic elements, often on a photographic background. But the photograph that's the background isn't from. It's always often a screen image, but of mediated, you know, deep space or a desert or abstract fields or symbols in our... Uh, is it a bit like automatic writing? Is it a bit, is it, you know, is it a bit like that you're saying that you see, you put something together and you see it and you know when it's right? No, well, uh, maybe if words have, I've got, yeah, you'd have a lot of words in your mind to choose from, is I've just got a kind of sea of cutout things which I've chosen that have definite themes I'm interested yeah. in that I want to provoke in the viewer and then yeah they come together like that mimetic slippage I was talking mm. about sometimes the colour will be what so you know mm. just yeah. the way you build but, and I, but I think it's also there's, there's lots of layers of it going on because it's the sound as well and, and you know With the lot, video yeah, yeah you know there's a lot of theory around sound as being much more open-ended than um, language etc so it I think it's very it's very related to the question about what is a photograph. It's, I don't think it's photography. I, for me, it's not photography. But I think what it's about is highly related to photography. If that makes sure. sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think something just quickly. Wait, something sure. um, we try and manipulate a lot is texture, whether it's sonic or visual. Yes. And for me. That's a huge, amazing thing to be experimenting with between the analogue and the digital photograph. Mm -hmm. Yes. Kina. Mm -hmm. Oh, just, just a couple of quick points. I've actually written down that what your work made me think about was what does, photo what does a photograph do? And I haven't read the Laurel to my shame, so it's quite interesting that that came up. The other thing that I kept thinking about was um, Benjamin's idea of the constellation. And this wonderful idea that in the constellation of fragments of things, sometimes things cohere at a moment, I'm not going to paraphrase this very well, where meaning becomes visible in a kind of flash in an instant, then it disappears again almost instantaneously as well. And I thought that was lovely in the way that you were saying that it was about those fleeting moments on the surface. It was very much about that notion of the constellation. I thought it was really beautiful in that respect, the sort of fluid temporary configurations. So those were really comments rather than yeah, sort of no, questions. Yeah. But I thought it was really interesting, this idea that, you know, I, I came in this morning and I turned to Daniel and I said, I think the question's wrong. I don't think we yeah. should be asking what a photograph is. But I think for you, you turned it to what can a photograph do and what can the photograph enact and kind of make possible. And I thought that was really nice. Especially now it can be all the things everyone else has been talking about today. Yeah. So many <laughs> mediums it can travel in. Yes. Yeah. And a starting point, a potential someone said earlier, so for photographs as a, as a potential, as a beginning, a catalyst for something else. Mm -hmm. That's still one is. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> we can discuss that later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rob. Anyway. Is it, is it more about Again, the, Rob. Sorry. <laughs> is, sorry. Is it that question? But is this more about the use of the photograph or the recognition that people have of the elements you've selected from a photographic culture? Because I was yes. thinking, I immediately went, I'm thinking of things that I'm really being exalted. 
the latter probably theoretically, but also very um, always have been very seduced by that kind of otherworldly sheen on the surface of. So it's a requirement that um, the viewer of the audience recognises at least some elements. Uh, yeah. In these works, yeah. Sarah and then Andrew. Uh, I might be partly restating the first part of what you just said. So what Rob just said. Yeah. Okay. Possibly. Um, hang on. Uh, right. So. Um, so you use the, the term screen image, I think, to describe part of what's going on in the film. And I was wondering first if you meant that in the Freudian sense. No. Okay. <laughs> um, well, probably always got that. Right, I know. Can I make a? Can I just, pro moment. just propose? <laughs> can I propose something based on yeah, the explosion that that yeah. made quickly? And my, I'm just thinking about um, about screens uh, as they function in Freud's uh, uh, theory of dreams, among other things, as these um, sort of. Well, as screens that like that 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 either partly block out or that cover over something like a pulsating uh, unconscious or like the repressed or maybe something like the quora, I thought that your use of the screen kind of it 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 really uh, illuminated if I can even use that word in this paragraph. It really illuminated uh, part of what felt so liminal to me in viewing the film. The idea that, that just behind some of those screens that kept changing, something was about to, so that which could never to give, believe. was about to believe, was yeah. about to give. And it was, as some people read Plato's Cora, especially the way that Chris Tabor reads it, of course, it was an intensely corporeal, almost giving of the condition or the unconscious or what have you. Well, um, um, can I just, yeah, that's amazing. I never thought I'd get excited that's your thing, about Freud. So you no, the, the, <laughs> the voodoo black mirror, which uh, we've done a lot of research into voodoo art and mythology, but basically the black mirror is between, it's a screen between this reality and the, their spirit world and you mm -hmm. summon things through it and it reflects outward like you can't really see into it mm. but then stuff comes out of it so actually you're right because that's a huge part of our kind of rhetoric about the screen I was doing a different talk. Let me just go to Andrew. Dream, just dream work. It like it might it might be really interesting to think about the pieces as a dream work. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it just seems to me we're still in the world of representation here, um, and that curiously enough, I kind of really follow what um, you're saying about how this operates as kind of metaphor. You what, Sarah? Well, I follow what you're saying. Follow. Yeah, follow. Every fire. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I think you can you you are invited to read this, whether it's psychoanalytically or not, um, through its kind of metaphoric language, which is kind of representational in the image. And you mentioned um, Ettinger's matrixial gaze. Did you in your piece? No, uh, well, matrixial borders space. Yeah, which but, yeah. is, you know, which I think is an attempt to, um, you know, rescue uh, aspects of psychoanalysis from uh, patriarchy, but nevertheless is still actually keeping us within the world of uh, representation and you know, the meanings that we attribute to uh, or associate with um, you know, the collage or the, the, the duration of this piece. Would you say then that if something can be read, it is producing uh, sort of ipso facto representational mm -hmm. tropes, and if it cannot be read or it's it's, it's sort of manifestation isn't about being read, then something else is going on that, that belies representation. So in other words, if one can get out of the linguistic turn, then one ends up uh, presenting a, a way in to talk about photography as visual 
where the visuality is not being read. It's being either enacted or inhabited or massified or something al yeah. alchemized, which is what you were doing. Or um, felt. Or felt. But I see, I didn't, I mean, maybe because I was sitting over here and maybe because I've seen your work in other places, but I didn't see it as being representational. It didn't evoke meaning for me in a kind of traditional sense. It pro pro provoked coherences. So it's something like that, or buzzes. Um, and so I had a totally, my, my readerly approach, if to the degree to it, or my visual approach, was completely aural with this. And I mean, I thought that it was only inundated with the sound, I mean, or, or amplified with the sound, as it were. Uh, I mean, the sound didn't have to be there. It would still have been a sound piece that was visual. Without, with or without the sound. And to me, that's just a, a very um, recent innovation about quite, uh, talking about photograph, uh, the photograph, what is a photograph. Um, so I, I, I don't know. So I, I sort of agree, I'm agreeing well, with you, but I'm also thinking there's a different way of handling that visuality. Yeah, I think if you imagined um, that what was being assembled there was assembled by the computer. Say so that was a generative. Yes. Yeah. If somebody had written a program where you put all those elements in, yeah. and then it, it actually produces yeah. um, kind of sequences and, yeah. and whatever, then I think you might, we might have had a different kind of understanding or had to think differently about what we were seeing. But here, um, that is, it wasn't uh, produced by a computer generatively. Mm -hmm. The computer was um, enlisted in the intention of the artist who made it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so therefore I think because the intentionality uh, of the artist is present in a durational narrative, then the overriding cultural convention is to decode it within yeah. a representational code. And we don't really have any other choice, but maybe if it had been... But I think we do have other choices. Uh, well, and I think not only do we have other choices, but we're in a situation where other choices are presenting themselves and requiring us to um, resituate so that the reading becomes hearing or the hearing becomes smelling or you know whatever. It, it, it requires different forms of sensibilities. But we could be wrong about that. I think that what, what, I'd, like to, what I'd like to do at the moment is just to, to alert everybody that we have two more speakers. We have Sheena. No, no we don't have Sheena. Um, uh, we have Dan. Dan, is Dan? Yes. Is. Dan is still there. Um, and Sarah, did you want to speak? No, you don't want to speak. We have one more speaker. Beth, did you want to speak? Beth is also going to speak. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is Beth. She was going to speak, but she's in the doorway, so that means she's she's nervous about speaking. Beth, why don't you just explain what you do, and then Dan will close off the session, and then we'll have some food, and we'll just talk. Come, 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 come. <laughs> Yes. Oh, and, and Mattia, sorry, Mattia. Yes, Mattia is also going to speak. So we have uh, three last speakers. There you go. See, there was, there was something to be said. Yes. Um, Beth is just going to speak for about a few, but just for about five minutes, because I just wanted to, to get a, give you a sense of um, what she's done with the question of, of what it is to have a photograph in the kind of work that she's doing, which is mainly public art, um, almost spectacle in a certain sense. Um, and uh, she's the Wheatley Fellow here at um, Biad and um, is an artist of long standing. Do we, do we actually have on the internet? Yes. Okay. So do you mind if I take a picture of this? No, no. Uh, do, is there something you want Luke to do? Um, He's the one. He, you can't touch anything. It's all oh, web based. Can I? Um, um, do you need to? Do you need to set up, Beth? I just know. I just okay. thought it might be better to show the, the film of the forest. Okay. Yeah. Are you guys okay? Are you you're like you know you're not suffering? Are you or do you need a break? <laughs> no, you're all right. We're okay, all good.
In 2001, coalition forces invaded Afghanistan. As of July 2012, 422 British soldiers have lost their lives, and over 12,793 Afghan civilians have died. More than 5.7 million Afghan refugees have returned to Afghanistan since 2002, increasing the population of the country by some 25%. However, not all refugees can return home. Actually, we are migrants from Afghanistan. The main reason is threat to my life and my family. We came together to UK. But now we realize that we sacrifice everything. We sacrifice a huge amount of cash, sacrifice our home, sacrifice our my job sacrifice my everything my wife she missing a lot her family her mother dad brother sister my kids also missing homelessness among veterans has been a controversial issue since the napoleonic wars today the media reports on veterans of the recent conflicts who find themselves without a roof continue there has been a feeling that veterans are particularly vulnerable to homelessness and are overrepresented amongst the ranks of those sleeping rough or residing in hostels. To be honest with you, it's, it's, it is a blur because you don't decide to come home as it happens. I got involved in a project called Shoulder to Shoulder and it's a dropping centre for guys and their families who are ex-services who are all suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, <coughs> they come into the centre not with just one problem, but with several. And then we talked about two hours, and that's when I dropped down, because that's when they actually hit me. That experience that I had through the military, also the experience that I had when I was growing up, I didn't address. Um, well, thanks very much, Johnny, for inviting me. <coughs> My name is Beth Derbyshire. That, this is a piece of work that I've uh, just completed in Birmingham, and I just wanted to really show you that film. Um, it, it was a mobile sculpture that had um, a soundscape, which, uh, which I've interviewed um, a, a, two communities. One was the uh, veteran military community based in Birmingham, and the other community was uh, the F from the Afghan refugee community, so two groups of people that had kind of ended up in this city, which has quite a curious um, history in, from, a from a military point of view, and also as a city of kind of modern communities. And so um, what we began, we had a discussion a few weeks ago about thinking about, you know, how something like Forest could exist as a photograph. I'm not sure I have the answer or whether it is well into this discussion, but it follows a series of works that I have made over the years where I kind of try to think about these things as sculptural photographs. So rather than making an image of a moving forest, I create a real moving forest. So, it's, it's, it, it, so that was one way of thinking about it in relation to this discussion. And also there was elements of the soundscape which were re we, for sort of ethical reasons, we had to re-record some of the oral histories with other people's other people from the Afghan community. So there's a sort of sense of a photographic representation kind of in, within an oral level. Um, that's anyway, that's kind of where I got to. I mean, you know, I we, or we could have some questions. Or well, I think that's what we should do. I mean, I think that uh, I just wanted you to, to see that what Beth is so that's not on. a photograph. No, 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 no. Do you see what but, mean? But that, it, that is. If you but see that, I invited her uh, to... Um, to, because she had a very unusual take on, on a photograph, which was that it was this living sculpture, or, or, or it was something else other than flat and on the wall or something that you borrowed. And I just wanted to introduce that idea in a, in a context of the question, what is a photograph, just to have you think about it. So are there any questions that you might 
uh, pose. I suppose that ties in with uh, sometimes quite a, it's an invitation to pay attention. It's an invitation to pay attention, yes. yes. That's nice. Yes. Yeah, okay. uh, well, I could, but then I go straight into it. You your, your own talk. No, yeah, like I can actually. That's, that's right. right. That's how right. yeah. um, Come up to the, do, do you have slides as well? No. No, no, okay, come to the front. Um, Can you say, this is Mattia Paganelli, and he is an artist. Originally from, where were you from, Milan, or? Uh, I originally was from Milan, yeah. yes. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and, and I somehow got my um, But <clears throat> my, um, your question is to Beth. My, the, the, my, my take on this question of what is a photograph uh, partially has been addressed in various interventions, questions, comments. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> very much I would like to, to think that adding to, to the conclusion of Lara Well that one shouldn't go for an essential definition of photography. Can you raise your voice? <clears throat> one shouldn't go for a, an, an essential definition of photography rather ask what the photograph can do. I would add to it what can be done with it. And I put it in, in an impersonal form because if I said what we could do with it, then there would be issues of agency, of authorship, um, which are very delicate. They are there, but they're very delicate. Nevertheless, uh, I think that more and more, and when I say more and more, I refer to the digital shift that we have experienced and we have still experiencing faster and faster. Um, there is something in, in the photographic practice, probably in all practices, that is not fixed in, in the representational form. And particularly in, uh, in, uh, with photography, um, if we think of what a photograph, photograph is, it, I believe we remain somehow um, tied or anchored to a certain specialized understanding of photography. Um, if physically, the photograph happens at least on three planes. The, the, the whatever reality one takes a picture of, both ends of the lens and the film, that was traditional photography, and now the digital sensor. There is a depth. Of the field of photography is deep. And that refers somehow to the figurative space of uh, modern figurality, of modern art, that goes from Renaissance to Cubism. There is an essay of uh, Frank Castell written in the 60s about that, which Lyotard picks up from, as in the, the projections of a depth of vision, um, a projection of space, a perspective. And that somehow is the first uh, space photography is described into when is, um, is taken as uh, an essential we found twice an essential definition of it. However, progressively, photography develops its own space and makes of this uh, depth uh, in, in a new form of uh, internal logic, but remains linked to this. So we are still re linked to the fact that photography is always referring to something, it's always a representation. Its etymology will always be a reality if we look at it in these terms. Instead, if we look at it as something that starts repeating itself and producing, or better, generating, and I say generating in terms of generation, in terms of feedback loops and, and um, complexities rather than produ production between subject and object, if you can start repeating and, and generating new series, new directions, then it completely alters um, what the approach we had toward it in traditional terms. And what do I mean by this? Is that, that the, the idea of a deep field of vision, of a perspective that would uh, accept photography, that would be a neutral receptacle, something a priori, a priori space that um, photography happens within, somehow fades away for a field that is um, expanding from the fact that photography is possible. Now, I say this with love, mm -hmm. but is there a question to Beth in there? Sorry? No, no, no. I'm not being yeah. the question. I okay, know. right. So, um. <laughs> no, I just because I think that it's important, because it sounds like what you're leading up to is to bring in, in part, what she was just doing, if I'm yes, not mistaken. Yes, I can conclude with that. What I want to reach um, is that 
if we look at generation rather than um, a pre-existing a priori space, if we are thinking of uh, sets of dimensions or, or vectors that intersect in a technology plus a culture plus intentions plus all the things we can add in a non-fixed number of uh, terms, every time they can be different, then there is um, a building of the present from the present, not um, according to uh, an, an origin. And therefore, the, the a priori of the space in which traditional photography would have happened disappears. And representation as such either disappears or at least changes radically it's, uh, it, the way we should approach it. And in, in this regard, if, you thought I, if your question was, should I present a photograph of it or present the real thing, that's um, somehow it, it's the same question taken backward. I mean, why should you, if you, if you can have the real thing, you do the real. But Although that's not the real thing. No, 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 that's, that's, yeah. Okay, that's. That's so again, is the model. But is the real thing that the, the video you've shown or the well, act of the body no, going down the center? The, the sculpture. The sculpture. It, I and mean, I made a series of other physical work, sculpture works, but a, a long time ago, where mm -hmm. I was, uh, where I, so for example, for one of those pieces of work, I had wanted to make a corridor that mm -hmm. was very similar to another, that was a, a kind of sculptural photograph of another such space in the mm -hmm. same building, so that it kind of created a moment of camouflage. It's not the same thing, mm -hmm. it's the same type of thinking. So I thought of that as a kind of, that, that piece had a very photographic element to it, that, that mm -hmm. particular work. I mean, it's a, it's a piece that I, at, at that time, I was making a series of sculptural interventions. I mean, this is going back almost 20 years where I was almost creating things that became visible within their own when you were like spaces. Seven. So, so, so it's not quite the same, but approaching the, the forest. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, obviously the rootless forest doesn't exist, so I'm not, I mean, I, I created it, so mm -hmm. there isn't an original. There's a sort of cultural notion of moving forest. There, there is no original. Is there a cultural idea of moving? Yes. Yeah, there, yes. There, well, there is from, from Shakespeare, yeah. from Wood. And so, anyway, it was sort of, I don't know. So what, what's the purchase that you have? And then we'll go back to Matthias. What's the purchase that one has? And I think Matthias was beginning to elaborate it. Uh, by calling something a living photograph. Like, what, what is the purchase on that? Like, why, why do that? I mean, apart from the fact that it fits nicely into our workshop. It, it, it fits nicely into our workshop. I mean, what is it about something that would be a living, what, what, what does it do to this thing called photograph to make it alive? Do you mean by life? Do you mean well, that, that's what Beth was saying, that the work she does is living photography. Well, is it living? Uh, no. I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily oh. call it that. Oh, no, I mean, you asked me to think about how I could bring something to this. Yes. I wouldn't say I, I do even photography. No, I think it has photographic elements to it. I wouldn't make that statement. And when you say photographic elements, then you mean archivally or something like that? No, I mean in terms of representation. Okay. Um, so thinking back to the earlier pieces, which I haven't got images of, mm -hmm. instead of, well, I just thought about them in photographic terms, so I, I, I just called them sculptural photographs. Sculptural photographs. Yes, sculptural photographs. Sorry, it was sculptural, sculptural photographs, photographs yeah. not living photographs. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, Matia, now continue, please. Um, Thank you. Well, I can relaunch it from, uh, from the moving forest. Um, the, the, I notice, because we all notice, it, that the, the, um, the newest development of uh, digital photography have produced a shift from um, a process, as Andrea has shown, that went through various steps all the way down, finally, uh, after a lot of expenditure, to a print as the image, as the result of photography, with a lot of time through. Now, we start with the image. And actually, there is a conflation between the camera and the image. We all these funny things. I don't own one, but everybody is there everywhere. Uh, the image is immediately there, even before the um, shutter release, whether it is real or, or digital, is, is pressed. The image is already there. So what is important now is all that can be done with it later on. How it circulates. It, somehow it tallies in with uh, Darren's uh, interventions about all the, the cultural heritage of that image, but not only. The images are either uploaded onto Flickr, tweeted, manipulated. There is a whole economy that, that happens. Um, so there is a, the, the idea that 
the image, the photographic image, is a representation of reality, somehow becomes far more difficult to, to sustain because at least in terms of um, 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 proof of that reality of taking a, of taking a picture of capturing um, it might still be there but it's there simultaneously already as an image so the, the image is live somehow it's no longer what was known as, as the photograph that is a different plane this lies has taken off from one thing and if you do an even sculpture like this somehow you also conflate uh, the the, 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 the level of the image, the vision of something, and the object, and the reality. I was thinking while watching the video that if it, if it had been, the video had been in black and white, it would have been different, of course, or different takes. So all that is already an image of something. But yeah. it, and I really want to underline it, not this, the moving sculpture. It is that moment where the, it, the, is no longer, uh, you can no longer open up in various layers. You're there. Mm -hmm. And if that to me is happening, if we understand photography, right, uh, not, no longer as the capturing of something, but of uh, the exploration of the possibility of a given technology, which is something else. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I meant before when I got so hot to say we have to discuss about using photography, not as a concept in abstract. It might have not been received in the right way, maybe it seems that we if are not photographers, we cannot speak about it. It's not what I meant. But there is, we, somehow there should be a renewed phenomenological approach to how these history and this technology manifest itself themselves. Otherwise, we, are, we are risk falling back constantly in, in the representational debate, at least, if not the uh, group. I mean, I think that that's very important, and I'm really glad that this is now uh, sort of summarizing, because we're going to move into Dan's uh, remarks, too, which are going to follow very similar to this. I think, uh, but I would just um, remind people that you know, in terms of advances in the technology, there's of course you know a 3DD and there's uh, augmented reality, and there's uh, different ways in which this thing called the photograph, the digital photograph, is, is leaping off the the surface and leaping somewhere else. And um, I think that that's this, that's why that was one reason I wanted Beth to present her work. Um, because it was um, this way in which one could think of sort of, not old fashioned, but you know, let's say relatively way, you know, uh, familiar ways of dealing with sculpture, dealing with movement, and then to think of it as a photograph, add something to the mix without having to immediately go to this a AR, uh, augmented reality type of way of thinking, although going to augmented reality is very important. And I'd only add that, I mean, as much as I love L'Oreal, and by the way, he's speaking next week in um, London, and if you want to come, you, meet, you need to talk to me about this. Um, it's invitation only, sadly. But um, the, um, he does make this argument over and again that what you can't ask what is, you have to ask what does it do. I don't agree with that. <laughs> Hence the question, what is photography? Because I think that there's a way to explode the is and to stop thinking that the is is either nothing that can't be reached or an excess or an abyss that in fact if the is ends up being similar to what Daniel was saying the God particle if in fact it is a positive nothing that that happens to be then you're already in the asking of the question as so often is the case giving it a bit of an answer and it seems to me that the that there hasn't there's not just one type of is there's double is there's several is's and those is's create this multidimensional flatness, or this, or this uh, something else that goes on that is called at this moment the present. And that's why I think that it's not, it's no longer an archival moment. It's no, no longer a capture. The present is something else that goes on. So, Rob, you were going to. I'm just going to say it's, a, it's like a different <coughs> language in terms of, for example, there are cameras now that are so well developed. You can do pieces of moving image and extract the still from them. You can you can go to the side of a wall and say, that's a time slice, this is the sculptural moment, this moment. Is that is that use of language, which is a technical point of view, only yeah. relative or problematic? No, that, that is a very important Daniel, what were you gonna say? Well, I just wanted to uh, I don't know, but echo what you said in order to be able to ask questions about the leaves, I think we have to somehow evacuate the subject 
Yes. Okay, so that becomes still a question of representation. We have to let go of representation and subjectivity, and only then we can ask about it. Is. But I think that what the is is necessarily will have something to do with technology. Talking about us here, because that's the one thing we will never be able to take off. We take off of our clothes or our jewelry, but technology is one thing we will never be able to take off. So that thing becomes easier. And that's why why won't we be able to take off? I mean, not that, I mean, I don't know about you guys, I'm freezing, so I would never take off my clothes anyway. But um, why would one not be able to take off uh, technology? Can you expand on that for people that might not see um, that point? For a number of reasons. One is because the way we look at the world is deeply technological, and I don't think we can go back to any kind of pre-technological experience of the world. We learned about it through the television screen, through the iPhones, through the camera, um, and it's just not possible to extract uh, yourself from, from these uh, understandings. They, they become what the ease is. Um, but I think, yeah, but I think that that's, that's the sense why the question about what is photography is so crucial. Photography is not just put one thing out there. It's not like the next people would have a sense that what is architecture or what is an automobile. We might, yeah, but, I'm kidding. but um, and perhaps there is a good argument for, for these things. But photography, I think, occupies a kind of privileged or maybe underprivileged place within all these discourses because it is the discourse. Um, of the technology itself, of, of the, almost the technology of technology. Mm -hmm. Through photography, the notion of how technology operates is given as an image. Okay, I'm gonna let yeah. you stop there for a second. Andrew? Well, I just wanna add that you also um, have to add that you know, what the photograph historically um, guaranteed was the subject. And if we'd say nice. that there's something happening at the level of uh, a change in photography, then we should also follow through that through and say, you know, then our ideas about the subject, the subject mass, is yeah. also changing. And I think if that's the case, then you know we have to think about the system of representation as more than any one of its technologies. You know, photography is very one of its. Very good. Very good. Yes, sir. I, I just think in order to um, in order to understand how something works, you have to isolate. Everything's not the same. And in order to understand what a photograph does, you have to isolate those parts of that means of communication which is different. And I think that they're not actually <coughs> about the content. They're not about the representation. I still, I mean, no, I still say... When photograph, you say it's not about... They're not, I, st you mean I still say that a photograph is still and indexical. <laughs> that, that is, that, I still say, I say that that is what is, isolates it from every other kind of communication, and that is its essence. And it's actually kind of what you said before, it's invisible, it's not there until it's made. Okay, before you know, and, and once, it's, once it's made, it's cultural. Can I just point out the fact that in the last ten percent of all the photographs that were taken in history have been taken in the last twelve months? And what are the That's also amazing. Statistics. Yes, but they're less good indexable. Oh no, 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 the electronic, the electronic image is an indexical <coughs> image. Yeah, it's still in, in, and it's still a still yeah. image. The question I would ask is why? Because there's a the why um, why can you take so many? There's a need. There's there's a persistence. Yeah. There's a cultural need for an indexical still image. And, and banality. But photographs were always banal. The majority of photographs were always banal. Do you know? I don't think that much has changed, actually. I don't. <laughs> okay. okay. So you introduce yourself. Uh, uh, I'm Rich James, I'm the opposite. Um, what interests me, what you say today, is that. You were saying that there's the, the three kind of three layers with the mm -hmm. camera, and you have and it goes all the way back to the film or the sensor. But it seems to me that it isn't talking about much. 
is that it's entirely subjective because it actually kind of starts in the mind of, of the photographer and ends up in the mind of the viewer. And that is, it, it kind of makes it absolutely subjective. There's no image that can't be interpreted in, you know, in, from two polar opposite points of view. It is light language in the, um, uh, how you perceive it and, and how the mind works seems to control what an image is and what a photograph is. You know, there's so many, so many mediums for photography. I mean, I work, or well, I have worked with stone machines where you can put a photo into, into a great big CNC machine and it will then turn that back into a 3D landscape mm -hmm. and, and carve it out just, just like that. And um, it just seems that the photograph is absolutely subjective and it's purely the, a, a balance between the mind of the photographer and the mind of the viewer that seems to, to decide what that image will be. And it will be different every single time. Um, I want to say why it is not subjective. I just want to say a couple of words about uh, <laughs> I want to well, say it. Anyway, Katrina, why don't you introduce yourself? Go ahead. I'm Katrina. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just, uh, this whole notion of the digital camera producing an indexical image, the, the cam digital camera outputs a JPEG or a TIFF as opposed to a stream of text or numbers or a song because it is designed to produce an image that's culturally continuous with what an analog photograph looks like. Mm -hmm. The design of algorithms to make it look photographic as possible. So I just wanted to... Um, yes, that yes, and then... Katrina and I just finished last weekend writing an article which we destroyed the index once and for all. It's not an article. <laughs> <laughs> so just, um, we can start uh, for you. <laughs> right. explain what is at issue here. The, the problem is that the, the notion of the image itself is an ideological notion. It's a concept. Now, because it, it is ideological, precisely because it, it conceals what, what is really taking place. For, 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 for the index to have any agency, one has to take as a given a fixed immobile subject for whom the world is outside of them and can be experienced as an image. You need to have this framework for index to have any meaning. So, in order for index to operate, you already situated a separation between yourself and the world. While you know everyone is free to do that, it is clearly a, a politically complicated position. You know, you could be in that position which you say myself and the world is one and the same thing. If you say that, if you establish a mimetic relationship as opposed to representational between yourself and the world, there is no room for index because me and you and everything else is one. Mm. But what I mean by index is that it has, it is uh, a trace of some of the real world. It's a trace. It's, and a, a digital photograph is information which is inputted from the real world. It's a trace of the real world. The computer can't make a photograph. It can't make an image. It has to be programmed to do that. It's a, it, has, it has a relationship, a trace relationship to that thing in the real. But I think that's a very specific kind of programming because there is programming that isn't based on that love, that type of algorithm. That's based on the algorithms where it programs something to learn. So, that, so under you know artificial intelligence, for example, and the way in which that operates, you you don't program it if this go that way, if that go that way. Instead, it produces something, and that that becomes the basis around which something else gets presented. To me, that was what um, Maggie's work was doing. It was kind of the computer was also producing. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I thought it was also producing <coughs> a certain thing, as it were. But, Mattia, why don't you have the last word, and then Dan is going to join it. Because I think Dan's work... Dan, is it fair to say that your work falls right into this, or are you going to talk about something completely different? Um, I haven't made up my mind yet. Okay. Very, <laughs> well, very quickly before you go, Mattia, before, before we start joining, can I just go back to Daniel quickly? What's your understanding of the index, then, in relation to that definition of the index? 
in relation to Sarah's definition. Sarah put on a, Sarah put oh, the on a definite, definite, definition of the index is trace. The Are you using that term in a different no, place? Or um, in the well, be I don't think there is a trace. Because if you think what actually happens in photography is that light makes an imprint on film. And then the film is uh, sealed in its canister or in its slide. And as long as it's there, it is it's what is called the latent image. Now, what is this latent image? No one knows because if you open it to peek inside, it's gone. Yeah. So the trace exists only as, no, as long as no one sees it. That's why I said earlier that true photography is invisible. Maybe you can make things visible, but only at the price of completely, <coughs> utterly destroying the trace. You know, it's like the different. It's like the uh, anyway, I don't want to, to, to bench Auschwitz at such a joyful occasion, but, <laughs> but, but it is like my like, like demand that Leota was talking about uh, in the different to bring a witness from the gas chambers. You cannot have a witness from the gas chamber, you cannot have a trace from the latent image, because by opening it up, you destroy it. So everything you have that looks like a photograph, it's just because you decided it to be so. You could imagine another species another optics in which there's absolutely no need to engage with all of that and the latent image the invisible image is as photographic as you will ever get Rob, just find out that if you use an SX-74 camera you don't have a latent image because it will come out and it will start immediately develop and you can't control it, you can't stop it so in much the same way as if you wanted a digital equivalent where it's there the Polaroid would be the digital equivalent yeah. Because you can't stop it. It's, it's not latent. So if you need any problems, there is one that already exists. But, but that's exactly <laughs> yeah. the point. Is that the even in, um, when I, to answer your question and to give my comment here, yeah. even in um, film photography, the issue of representing a reality comes in, as you rightly said, from a paradigm of representation that, you have to go up a bit. that takes in all of these technologies. <laughs> And that's absolutely true. Sorry. The microphone, you move it slightly. It's going to the back. Okay. But even in film photography, yeah. I've got the Nico. Um, um, the, the, no, I lost what I was saying. Yes, even in film photography, um, we are uh, somehow captured by a paradigm of representation that is bigger than all of its technologies. This was the way you put it before, yes. And I think that instead, uh, and this is why the, the, the photography becomes, or can be seen at least, as um, spliced into various planes, the reality, the lens, the film, the eye of the photographer, the eye of the person who looks at it. But I think that if instead we look at these technologies as and I would say these both, the, the uh, film and the digital, um, as uh, abilities. Um, Samuel Weber writes a very interesting book titled Benjamin Abilities, it's dash abilities in, in small cap, because it, it points out that Benjamin often attaches the suffix abilities to various concepts and then develops notions of iteration. And Samuel Weber brings in the redada to um, analyze how from the possibility of one technology something develops completely sideways in a different direction and opens up new aesthetic spaces. Um, the most famous one is the art in the age of mechanical reproducibility, but there are various examples there. Now, this belongs to both analog and digital. And if we look at it like this, in this form of generative um, expansion rather than a projection of depth over a three-dimensional Cartesian space, the, which is the base for a subject over a background, as Biotar describes. We have instead, no, if, if we, we don't take these as a paradigm and we look at generation, then um, epistemology and aesthetics are on the same side. And mo therefore, more, more importantly, we are, instead of representing something, we are constantly in a poetic process <coughs> where the sense of the image is made as part of a set of dimensions that are peculiar to, to, to that image and, and not represented in that image. Mm -hmm. Makes a little sense, actually. Do, do uh, people have any other comments on this? I don't miss, uh... So 
Yes, Andrew, well, sorry. Just one very quick. I mean, it just seems to me that at this stage in the afternoon, before a cup of tea, <laughs> what is stalking us? You know, is the need for a cup of tea. No, well, there's that. <laughs> but there is the kind of question of the real. Of, of the real. Of the real. Mm. You know, because what is a photograph is just kind of leading us inexorably to you know, this terrible, huge, big thing. About, uh, welcome to know, philosophy. Yeah, no. <laughs> what is the real? Uh, okay, so we'll take a break on what is the real, and then Dan uh, and um, and if Dan will sort of take up the uh, edge. We'll, we'll have a fifteen minute break, and then we'll basically come back here and finish off. Dan will come back and tell us what the real is. What the real is. Dan is the right person to tell what the real is. <laughs> 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 